Hi, my name is Manoj K. Sarvani, and I'm an interventional cardiologist here at the UC Davis Medical Center. I'm excited to discuss the evolution of coronary physiology from FFR to IFR and other non hyperemic pressure ratios. Here's an outline of the topics I'll be discussed. First, I will begin by providing you with a definition of FFR and review background. We'll discuss the practical aspects of FFR as well. In particular, we'll spend quite a bit of time reviewing the evidence for FFR, particularly in terms of the FAME 1, FAME 2, and DEFER trials. Additionally, I'd like to provide you with a definition of the instantaneous weight-free ratio and review background in this subject area as well. We'll also discuss the evidence for IFR, particularly in terms of the defined flare and sweetheart trials. And then lastly, we'll discuss future directions. This is a graph taken from a study of 143 patients with known three vessel coronary artery disease. On the y axis, we have percent of patients. On the x axis, we have various defect patterns. So we have 18% of patients where they have no defect. In terms of one vessel disease, 36% of patients, when in fact, again, these patients have three vessel coronary artery disease. A two vessel pattern is seen in 36% of patients, and then in only 10% of patients do we actually see a three vessel pattern. And then when we lump together the two vessel and three vessel pattern and define that as multi vessel disease, we see that we do a little bit better at 46%. Now, how do we do when we incorporate function? In other words, when we incorporate gated imaging? Well, we do better. Now, in terms of the multi-vessel disease pattern, we see 60% of patients being detected as having that pattern. However, the purpose of the slide is to illustrate an important point that even with stress imaging, we're not able to get the true extent of three-vessel coronary artery disease. There are certainly limitations. Let's now define what FFR represents. FFR is a ratio of maximum blood flow in a synodic artery to maximum blood flow of the same artery where normal. It can also be thought of as the index of the resistance of flow along the epicardial vessel. Mathematically, it can be expressed as shown as a ratio of coronary flow across the synodic lesion divided by coronary flow if that synodic lesion was not present. In addition, it's important to remember that FFR accounts for collateral flow and is generally not influenced by systemic hemodynamics. But often, it becomes a lesion-specific index of myocardial ischemia, as we will see. But why FFR? Especially when coronary angiography has unrivaled spatial and temporal resolution and remains a roadmap for both interventional cardiologists and cardiothoracic surgeons alike. Well, as early as the 1960s, it was obvious that the coronary angiogram is limited. The angiogram is a two-dimensional silhouette, a luminogram, of a three-dimensional vascular lumen. This is illustrated here with an eccentric plaque, where in the RAO projection, we don't quite get the true severity of the lesion. And then the LAO production, we don't do much better. But it's even worse when we're dealing with a concentric stenosis, where in both the RAO and LAO projections, we're not able to truly capture the actual severity of the stenosis. However, the lesion may look hazy on the angiogram. However, the coronary angiogram also fails because it cannot account for the multiple factors that contribute to coronary resistance to blood flow. So in this figure of a coronary artery, where this is the proximal segment and this is a distal segment, in terms of this irregular stenosis that undergoes a pressure drop, it undergoes this pressure drop due to interest effects, friction loss, and zones of turbulence accounting for separation energy loss. More specifically, the drop in pressure across the stenosis 
is dependent on coronary blood flow, is dependent on the lesion length, the area of stenosis as compared to the reference area, as well as coefficients for viscous and separation. Also, we cannot forget the effects of flow separation. So together, all this contributes to the coronary resistance to blood flow that we can't account for by just simply looking at a coronary angiogram. So let's define FFR in a little bit more detail and discuss how it is derived. Thus far, I've discussed FFR as a ratio of two coronary flows. But those who are familiar with FFR remember that actually in the CAFA, we're thinking about it as the ratio of two pressures. So how do we derive, how do we get to that? So let's think about Ohm's law, where coronary flow is equal to the change in pressure divided by resistance. So if we make several substitutions, what we find is that FFR is equal to the distal pressure, or the pressure within the coronary vessel, minus coronary venous pressure, divided by resistance across the stenosis. And then again now, looking at this entity, we have aortic pressure minus coronary venous pressure divided by the resistance if there was no stenosis. And so in the setting of hyperemia, what happens is that resistances become minimal and constant, and so they can cancel out. And so now we're left with FFR equaling the entities I've, as shown here, where we have distal coronary pressure minus venous pressure divided by the aortic pressure minus coronary venous pressure again. But for the most part, venous pressure is essentially zero. So then we can substitute again and represent FFR as a ratio of two pressures, where we have distal pressure divided by aortic pressure. And as shown here, we have on the x-axis hyperemic coronary perfusion pressure, and then we have on the y-axis hyperemic myocardial blood flow. And what we see is that there's a perfect linear relationship between coronary perfusion pressure and hyperemic myocardial blood flow. Let's now get into a little bit more nitty gritty and talk about FFR cutoffs. We say that FFR is not functionally significant, or the lesion is not functionally significant, when the FFR value is greater than 0.8. In other words, the lesion of interest is not producing myocardial ischemia. When the FFR value is 0.8 or less, the lesion is functionally significant. In other words, it is producing myocardial ischemia. But like all diagnostic tests, FFR has an area of ambiguity which spans less than 10% of the entire range of FFR values. This is referred to as the gray zone, where the FFR value is between 0.75 to 0.8. So sound clinical judgment is needed here in order to make a decision about whether myocardial revascularization should be performed or not. This is taking into account whether the patient has had a stress test and whether that stress test shows evidence of myocardial ischemia. FFR also has a direct clinical correlate. When we have an FFR value of 0.6, for example, that means the coronary blood flow has been reduced by 40% compared to whether or a situation in which the stenosis is not present. And then lastly, the normal range of FFR values extends from 0.94 to 1. The reason the range extends below 1 is because in validation studies, when FFR was performed in normal arteries but with remote disease in a different vascular territory, FFR values would be as low as 0.94. I will admit, though, that this is controversial to some degree. We're still learning about doing FFR post-PCI and determining what should the normal range be after we performed PCI in a vessel and repeated FFR. FFR is well validated. Shown in the first column of this table are numerous validation studies. In the next column is the size of these various studies. In this third column 
are the studies to which FFR was compared to. In this fourth column, we have best cutoff value for FFR. For example, in this first study, the best cutoff was determined to be 0.75 for FFR. And then shown in this last column is the diagnostic accuracy for FFR. So this first study by Nico Peels is really considered the quintessential validation study for FFR. This is because it compared FFR to electrical, perfusion, and functional measures of myocardial ischemia. And in doing so, it determined that the sensitivity and specificity for the detection of functioning significant ischemia by FFR was 88 and 100% respectively when a patient underwent all three of the studies. Now, it's also important to remember whether FFR should be used in the post-MI period. Now, certainly if a patient's undergone an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, in that acute setting, it's not ideal to perform FFR in a non-culprit vessel. This has to do with the fact that FFR is dependent on being able to vasodilate the microvasculature. And as all cardiologists know, the microvascular function is disrupted in the setting of an acute STEMI. This has to do due to multiple factors. Number one, first and foremost, is that there's increased production of endothelium one, as well as norepinephrine. And the combination of these two substances is going to result in vasoconstriction of the microvasculature. In addition, what happens is the microvasculature becomes less re responsive to the endogenous production of adenosine. The adenosine receptors are less responsive, again, to adenosine. And lastly, what we find is that actually there's an increase in LVEDP frequently in the setting of an acute STEMI, and there's also myocardial edema. And both of these in together contribute to compression of the microvasculature and together result in microvascular disruption, such that when we perform FFR on average in the acute STEMI period, the result will be 0.03 higher than what it should be, because again, we're not able to vasodilate the microvasculature. But if we were to report, re, repeat FFR two weeks later, what we find is that the FFR values normalize and they decrease by on average of 0.03. But what about IFR? What about using IFR in the non-culprit vessel in the setting of an acute STEMI? Well, there's problems here as well. That has to do with the fact that in a setting of acute STEMI, what we find is in the non-culprit vascular territory that there's hyperkinesis in that distribution. And what happens in that distribution is that there's an increase in resting coronary blood flow, such that the IFR result will end up being worse than what it should be as compared to two weeks later. We find on average the IFR result is 0.01 lower than what it would be otherwise. But when we're talking about doing an end STEMI, it's very reasonable to think about doing FFR or even IFR five to seven days after that myocardial infarction. Let's now get into some practical aspects of FFR. Whenever performing FFR, we of course need a guiding catheter. We prefer using a guiding catheter as compared to a diagnostic catheter because of the fact that there's a larger internal lumen. And because there's a larger internal lumen, the aortic pressure measurement, as well as the coronary distal pressure, will be more accurately assessed. It will be higher and normal. And then we also need to think about the pressure wire. So we have many different pressure wires now available. Shown here an example of pressure wire X, where we have the radio opaque part of the wire. And then we have the pressure sensor, which is at the transition between the radio opaque portion of the wire and the part of the wire that you really can't see very well. And the other important point to think about pressure wires is that the pressure sensor comes in two forms. It can be a piezoelectric sensor or an optical sensor. Piezoelectric sensors are particularly helpful when we're measuring dynamic pressure changes as compared to an optical sensor. 
So you should think about the Phillips volcano system. You should think about the Apis system when we're thinking about a piezoelectric sensor. You should think about the Opsin system or the Boston Scientific Comet system when you're thinking about an optical sensor. Another key part to this is also anticoagulation. We want to make sure that the activated clotting time is at least greater than 200 seconds before we're inserting a pressure wire into the coronary vessel. I've gone a little ahead of myself, and I also want to show to you an example of the pressure wire, comet wire, associated with the Boston Scientific System. Now here's a cartoon. In this cartoon, we've shown insertion of the pressure wire. But before we're actually inserting the pressure wire, what we're doing is we're making sure that the pressure sensor is at, is at the tip of the guide catheter at the very beginning part of the left main coronary artery. And what we're doing is we're looking at the aortic pressure and the pressure at the sensor. And we want to make sure that they're superimposable such that the ratio at rest is 1. So depending on the system, we are going to normalize or equalize to make sure that ratio is in fact one. When we do that, we will also often want to think about or frequently want to think about making sure that the wire introducer is removed out of the guide catheter 2E system. This is important because when we're measuring the pressure across the stenotic lesion, we also want to make sure that the wire introducer is removed. If this decision is made to keep the wire introducer in place at the time of equalization, then it should be kept in place when the wire is advanced across the stenotic lesion. So once the wire or the sensor is advanced across the stenotic lesion, we want to make sure that the wire is positioned in a distal portion of the vessel. We know from several observational studies that the FFR or IFR result will end up being lower when we do advance the vessel further down the vessel. And that has to do with the fact that frequently there's disease throughout the entire vessel and we want to account for that. We don't want to assess just the lesion of interest. We want to assess the entire vessel so we can determine whether the pattern of disease is focal or diffuse because that might change our PCI strategy in that situation. Now what we're looking for once we advance that wire across the lesion is we're looking to see what the waveform looks like. So in terms of the guiding catheter where we're measuring PA, that should be unchanged. And that should look like a normal aortic pressure tracing. However, in terms of the pressure wire and the level of the sensor, if the lesion is significant, frequently what we will find is a ventricularization pattern. We don't have to see that, but we frequently do. And then we're looking at the ratio, again, of PA and PD in that scenario. And then, and then once we measure, we measure that, after we've after we given actually hyperemic stimuli to make sure that the microvasculature has basically dilated appropriately, and we'll get into more of those details shortly, we're going to pull the wire wire back, and we're going to look and see where most of the pressure drop is taking place. And we're going to get a sense and understand whether the pressure drop is full or diffuse. And then finally, and then finally once that pressure wires, wires pulled into, into the guide catheter, to the top of the main, main, we want to make, want to make sure, sure that, that the value, the value is, is again 1. If we, if have, we have a phenomenon called signal drift, 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 drift that's greater than 2%, than 2 percent, for, example, for example, perhaps, perhaps on the wire the wire back, we find that the ratio of the PAA in the guide catheter is now 0.95. And that and certainly, that certainly is five percent later than two percent. We have to consider, have to consider BPD, 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 and FDR, 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 FDR assessment, assessment because there is there has been signal drift. Signal drift. Now, signal, signal drift, 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 drift can happen due to a variety of causes. Of causes. Sometimes, sometimes it can be due to temperature change, change or the area of sensor sensor. Sometimes it can be due to microbial form warm. And sometimes what patients patients lab find is that there's different types of the force of the coronary vessel that can cause things to be different. After we do this pressure wire assessment, we'll pull it back to confirm that there has been not significant signal drift. 
And so those are important things to think about. Think about. One last one thing last I want to mention, mention is that, is that we want to be smart in terms of, terms of our, of our, our measure measures. In fact, in there's fact, a term in terms of smart, smart, smart of our algorithm. We're averaging the lowest of our results of our five consecutive starting cycles of at least nine quality weeks. And so when we're looking at the pressure tracing, a PDDA, a PDDA, a ratio, we want to make sure, make sure that it's a good it's a pressure trace and, and, and that the ratio we're, we're seeing is preserved, preserved through multiple cardiac, cardiac cycles, cycles by, by to be, to be specific. specific. And now here's and a here's cartoon showing that we want to make sure that there's been a dosing of a signal threat. We've talked about anticoagulation. Now we should move on and talk about hyperemic stimuli. So hyperemia and vasodilation of microvasculature are mediated via the adenosine 2A receptor. IV adenosine is the most commonly used agent during FFR and is considered the gold standard. This is because it has a half-life of 1 to 2 minutes, which allows for adequate time to perform a pullback maneuver under maximal hyperemia. It should be administered ideally through a central venous catheter at a dose of at least 140 micrograms per kilogram per minute because it's important to remember that adenosine is going to undergo peripheral metabolism. So if we place it through a peripheral IV, we have to be careful about peripheral metabolism of adenosine. In fact, many operators overcome this by using a higher dose of IV adenosine a dose of 180 microgram per kilogram per minute. So I would say that practically speaking, it's probably reasonable to administer IV adenosine over a peripheral IV. I do this very frequently. As long as you are ensuring that a hyperemic response is taking place, the patient is feeling flushed, we're seeing that there is a decrease in mean aortic pressure, I think those are all important things to do. You don't necessarily have to put a central venous catheter in in order to do this because frequently, as all of you know, we are just simply doing a left heart catheterization with a diagnostic coronary angiogram. Another option is intercoronary denison. However, intercoronary denison has fallen out of favor because of its short half-life of 30 to 60 seconds, which prevents a pullback from being performed. However, the advantage of using intercoronary denison is it, it's short acting. The disadvantage is that patients will experience chest burning through activation of the adenosine 2A receptors. So what about the use of regadenison? Regadenison has really become very popular. The reason regadenison has become very popular it's a selective adenosine agonist. And in being a selective adenosine agonist, what we find is that patients have less side effects. So in a small study published in Euro Intervention in 2015, 100 patients were evaluated. These patients underwent FFR using IV adenosine, as well as FFR separately using 400 micrograms of regadenosine. And what we found is that there was good agreement. In fact, the correlation coefficient was 0.991. And we also looked at the blunt altman plot and found that that was also acceptable, showing that the correlation is very valid. Another question that comes up is, is caffeine okay? As you remember, whenever we're doing a cardiac spike study, we'll often instruct the patient to avoid caffeine for 24 to 48 hours. So when we're administering adenosine or even regadenosine, the question comes up, well, is it okay for the patient to receive caffeine? So in a small study where FFR was performed before caffeine and after caffeine, what we find is that the FFR value is not different. And this is also confirmed not to be statistically significant. I think practically speaking, it's important to remember that the data that we obtain is only as good as the way we obtain it, our techniques. So in general, I really encourage patients to avoid caffeine over 24 hours if, if they're undergoing an elective procedure. In general, patients have to be NPO anyway, so they're not receiving caffeine at least for 12 hours prior to the procedure. 
So I think it's good practice, despite what the study may show, to avoid caffeine administration when planning to do FFR. Now, another agent to consider as far as a hyperemic agent is nitroprusside. That also can be administered in an intercoronary fashion. It also has a relatively short half-life. The advantage is it's got a time to maximal effect that's relatively short, just 10 seconds. And again, it's short acting. The disadvantage is it could drop the blood pressure more significantly than you can with the denison. But again, IV denison has really become the gold standard. And the majority, or if not all, of the validation studies, the FAME 1, FAME 2 trials, used IV denison as a vasodilator of choice. And so I think it's reasonable if you're going to think about whether your patient is going to be a part of these trials to think about using IV adenosine. Now, contrast medium is also a hyperemic agent. In fact, contrast FFR was recently compared in terms of diagnostic accuracy to adenosine derived FFR, resting whole cycle, PD, PDA, and the instantaneous wave free ratio. Shown to the left is a complete protocol that was used in the study. So first, these patients underwent whole cycle PDPEA, IFR, then ultimately they underwent FFR, and ultimately, and lastly, they underwent contrast. And what we look for in terms of increasing accuracy, or what we think about at least, is that FFR has a diagnostic accuracy of about 95%. Contrast FFR is just behind that at 85%. When you think about resting phys physiology, non hyperemic pressure ratios, like IFR, it's 80%. Corneal angiography is 65%, and the coin flip is 50%. So you want to think about a coin flip and how these other modalities compare to that. But I want to really caution you, and I want you to think about the fact that why should we necessarily think about FFR as being the gold standard? FFR was compared to exercise tolerances, cardiac expect, treadmill stress echocardiogram, but those are not the gold standards. So again, you really want to think about that, particularly when we're conveying IFR to FFR, and I think many people that use non hyperemic pressure ratios on a routine basis would really argue that the diagnostic ac accuracy of IFR may be much higher, especially when we're comparing to FFR. We just talked about how FFR has limitations when we're thinking about the microvascular being, di being disrupted. And when the microvasculature is being disrupted, it certainly that can happen not only just acutely, it can happen chronically. Patients can have coronary microvascular disease where FFR may be very inaccurate when we're assessing the epicardial stenosis of interest. By the way, not to digress too far, in this study where we use contrast as hyperemia, patients were getting about 8 to 10 cc's of contrast media injected in the vessel, depending on whether it was a right coronary artery or a left anterior descending artery. Let's move on now and talk about other FFR technologies and concept, concepts. The commitment to FFR use in physical assessment is reflected, I think, by the number of new and emerging technologies in the field. So we certainly have new FFR hardware. When I think about hardware, I'm thinking about the wire. So this is a cartoon of the new Comet wire that's now available in limited release, but will soon be available to all operators. And so there's a real commitment by Boston Scientific and other companies like Abbott, as well as Philips Volcano and Opsons, all of them to really improve the wire technology that's available to perform FFR or non hyperemic pressure ratio assessment. Another consideration is a rapid exchange FFR microcatheter. We don't want to forget about that. We want to remember that these pressure wires, although they're improving, have characteristics that are not that similar to our workhorse wires, although that's improving. We now have the Omni wire, for example. We have the pressure wire X, and they have better handling characteristics, but they're not quite yet like workhorse wires. So the idea of using your workhorse wire and then putting down a rapid exchange FFR microcatheter that's able to measure PD, PDA during hyperemia has real advantages. 
Another consideration, of course, is the instantaneous wave-free ratio and other non-hyperbaric pressure ratios. So there's been a lot of great research in the area of non-hyperbaric pressure ratios, looking at the advantages of them as compared to FFR. And so we have more in our toolkit in terms of coronary physiology. And we have to think about the right scenario to think to use FFR versus IFR or other non-hyperbaric pressure ratios. But personally, I'm very excited. In addition to this, FFR can be derived by coronary CTA with heart flow, Siemens, Canon, Pulse Medical. There are a lot of companies in this space, as well as through coronary angiography with a CathWorks system. However, CathWorks is not alone. We have Pi Medical in this space, as well as Medicine Pulse Medical, working with a QFR system. So what's exciting is that there's a lot of physiology that can be assessed in a patient using CT before the patient ends up in the cath lab. And then once the patient is in the cath lab, we don't always have to give adenosine. There's options of not giving adenosine, particularly if we're concerned about a patient having adverse effects to adenosine. And not only that, we don't necessarily even have to put a wire in the coronary vessel, particularly if there may be challenges in putting a wire in a lesion of interest. So again, a lot of excitement here and a lot of ways to access the physiological significance of coronary lesion even before the patient is in the cath lab and then a lot of options once a patient is in the cath lab. Now let's get into the evidence for FFR. But before I do that, I did want to make a comment that in terms of the practical aspects of FFR, it's very important once a pressure wire is placed into the coronary vessel to administer an agent like intercoronary nitroglycerin to vasodilate the epicardial vessels. Because sometimes what will happen is the FFR result will be falsely positive, abnormal, producing myocardial ischemia because of epicardial spasm making that lesion worse than what it really is. So I always take care to administer nitroglycerin once the pressure wire is placed down into the distal vessel and prior to obtaining my FFR measurements. With that said, let's now move on and discuss the evidence for FFR. So way back in 2011, the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and the Society of Coronary Angiography and Interventions produced a PCI guideline statement. In that statement, they gave FFR use a class 2A indication based on level A evidence. FFR is reasonable to assess angiographic intermediate coronary lesions, in other words, 50 to 70% diameter stenoses, and can be useful in guiding revascularization decisions in patients with stable ischemic heart disease. So again, in 2011, but in 2012, there were the stable ischemic heart disease guidelines also recommending the use of FFR. In those guidelines, FFR was given a class one indication, which is the right thing to do based on the number of randomized controlled trials demonstrating its benefit. So in the US guidelines, we do have a class one indication for FFR. However, in contrast, in the 2018, European Society of Cardiology and Myocardial Revascularization Guidelines, in terms of functional testing for lesion assessment, they give a class one indication with level A evidence for this statement. When evidence of ischemia is not available, FFR or IFR are recommended to assess the hemodynamic relevance of intermediate grade stenosis. Let's set the context now for why it's so important to treat myocardial ischemia. In coronary artery disease, the presence and extent of exudosal ischemia is the most important factor that predicts outcomes. We know this, no doubt. So this graph comes from a widely referenced prospective cohort study of 10,627 patients who underwent cardiac SPECT. So on the y-axis, we have cardi the cardiac death rate expressed as a percentage. On, excuse me, on the y-axis that is, on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have the cardiac spec result expressed as a percent ischemia of total myocardium. So this ranges from 0% all the way up to greater than 
and the green represents patients that received initial medical therapy. And these patients that received initial medical therapy, you can see the cardiac death rate clearly increases as there is more and more myocardial ischemia. In contrast, when patients undergo early revascularization by PCI, which after all is meant to relieve myocardial ischemia, and undergo <clears throat> further assessment, what we find is that the cardiac death rate decreases, particularly in those patients that have the most ischemia, that we see that cardiac death rate decrease significantly. So this sets the context for why PCI is so important and why it may offer a mortality benefit, given that's very controversial. So let's talk about the COURAGE study. I poke fun and say, do we have the courage to admit the truth? So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve taken from the COURAGE study, which randomized 2,287 patients to PCI plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. These patients had stable angina with evidence of myocardial ischemia with either stress testing or resting ECG before they underwent coronary angiography. On the y-axis, we have survival free from death and MI expressed as a percentage. On the x-axis, we have years since randomization. And what we find is that there's no difference between the two groups or the two arms of the study. So at a median follow-up of 4.6 years, again, there's no difference in the two arms of the study. However, there are many caveats to the study, as we'll discuss in the FAME-2 trial study. The hazard ratio, by the way, is 1.05 with a p-value of 0.6, but with a confidence interval, it does cross 1. During extended follow-up period of 15 years involving 1,000, 1,200 patients to be specific, 53% of the original cohort, we again see no difference between the initial PCI plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone's arm. I think it's really important to point out, though, in the CURS trial, a major limitation is the fact that there was quite a bit of crossover. We found that up to a third of patients were undergoing PCI at a median follow-up of 4.6 years. So I think the CURS trial actually is a better assessment of an initial strategy of medical therapy which no interventional cardiologist would argue against. Of course, in a patient that has coronary artery disease, we need to put these patients on appropriate guideline-driven medical therapy. But if they continue to have a high burden of myocardial ischemia and symptoms, then the strategy of PCI plus medical therapy may be a very good option for them. I'd like to turn your attention now to the Kirsch Trial Nuclear Substudy 2. In this hypothesis-generating study, 314 patients underwent a cardiac spec before and after PCI or medical therapy. So on the y-axis, we have proportion of patients. On the x-axis, we have the two cohorts, PCI plus medical therapy versus medical therapy. And we see the proportion of patients with ischemic reduction of 5% or greater. And we're seeing that a third of patients in the PCI plus medical therapy arm are achieving this compared to only 20% in the patients on medical therapy arm. So there's no doubt that PCI does relieve myocardial ischemia, although this is in contrast to the Orbita trial in which we assessed how patients did following PCI versus medical therapy in terms of exercise duration on a treadmill test. And what we learned from that study was that there wasn't really an increase in how much time a patient would be able to exercise following PCI. But that comes with the caveat that that wasn't true guideline-driven medical therapy. PCI has to be done with guideline-driven medical therapy, and that doesn't only include medications. That includes also consuming a Mediterranean diet and also doing physical activity and doing at least moderate or strenuous physical activity for at least 150 minutes per week. So think about that when we're thinking about comparing PCI plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. So let's talk now about the FAME-1 trial. This is a trial that evaluated whether FFI-guided PCI improves cardiovascular outcomes. The inclusion criteria for this study were all patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. So it's important to remember that the FAME-1 study was a study of patients with multivessel coronary artery disease. 
we need to contrast that to the IFR data involving the Sweetheart trial and the Define Flare trial. The key exclusion criteria were patients that had left main disease, an ST segment elevation myocardial infarction within the last five days, prior cabbage, and extremely torturous or calcified coronary vessels where FFR wouldn't be possible anyway. So in terms of the study's design, again, patients with stenosis of 50% or greater and at least two or three major epicardial vessels were the population of interest. So you had to identify all stenosis 50% or greater for which sending was planned based on the coronary angiogram. And then the patients were randomized in one-to-one -one fashion to an angiography-guided PCI strategy versus an FFR-guided PCI strategy. And the angiography or angio arm, all stenoses were stented. And the FFR-guided PCI strategy arm, FFR was measured in all indicated stenoses, and P PCI was performed in only those stenoses where the FFR result was 0 0.8 or less. At least in the initial study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was one year follow-up. And the primary endpoint in this trial was a composite of death, MI, and repeat revascularization. Key secondary endpoints included individual components of the primary endpoint, procedure time, cost effectiveness, and the rates of adverse cardiac events. When we look at baseline characteristics that we would expect for a well-designed and performed randomized controlled trial, there is no major differences between important baseline characteristics between the two arms of the trial, between the angio group and the FFR group. Moving on in terms of baseline characteristics, in terms of number of indicated lesions per patient, roughly the same between the two groups with no statistically significant difference. The severity of lesions was also quite similar, though for whatever reason, patients with one or more total occlusions were seen more frequently in the FFR group. Obviously, FFR could not be performed in those vessels. I should also mention that the syntax score, the average syntax score in the two arms of the study was very similar at about 14.5. Now, when we look at the primary outcome, adverse events at one year, death, MI, or repeat rasterization, what we find is that more patients in the angio group arm, 18.4% of patients, are achieving this endpoint compared to the FFR group which is statistically significant. We see no statistically significant difference in terms of death between the two groups, though more patients in the angio group arm are achieving this endpoint. In terms of death or MI, a secondary endpoint that was not pre-specified, again, not pre-specified, we found that there were more patients in the angio group arm achieving this endpoint compared to the FFR group with a p-value that is statistically significant. We'll pay attention to this outcome at two years. And in terms of cabbage or repeat PCI, there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups, so the FFR group did achieve less of this. And in terms of total number of major adverse cardiovascular events, less of this was occurring in the FFR group, which was statistically significant. Now, it's important to pay attention to the MIs. Were they paraprocedural MIs, or were there other types of infarcts? Obviously, in the angio group arm, these patients are undergoing more my excuse me, undergoing more PCI, so their risk for having more paraprocedural MIs. But we find in terms of this endpoint of MIs that it was not driven solely by paraprocedural MIs, that a significant number of patients were having true infarctions, late or large. And so it was 8.7% in the angio group arm versus 5.7% in the FFR group arm, which was statistically significant. Now, in terms of one-year costs and procedural results, we see that roughly the same amount of time was required in either arm of the study, surprisingly, but found to be true in the FAME-1 study. In terms of contrast, less contrast was used because less stents were being placed. In terms of cost of materials per procedure, it ended up being less than the FFR group. And the length of hospital stay, for whatever reason, ended up being lower in the FFR group. Maybe it was driven by paraprocedural MI to some degree. Now let's look at adverse events of two years. Now looking at that primary endpoint of death, MI, or repeat revascularization, 
although less patients in that far group are achieving this endpoint, it's no longer statistically significant. So there's some type of catch-up phenomenon occurring where patients are undergoing a little bit more MI repeat vascularization after the first year. In terms of death, again, a little bit of a catch-up phenomenon, but no statistically significant difference between the two groups. But death or MI, that secondary endpoint that wasn't pre-specified, does remain statistically significant with more patients in the angio group arm achieving this endpoint. With regard to cabbage or repeat PCI, the same trend that we see in one year, and in terms of total number of major adverse cardiovascular events, again, less patient in the FFR group achieving this endpoint at two years, like a scene at one year. So I think the real take home message of the FAME 1 study is that FFR guided PCI prevents more death or MI at two years than an angiography guided strategy. So we do have five-year follow-up data. So when we look at major adverse cardiovascular events and death, again, major adverse cardiovascular events and death, what we find is that there is no statistically significant difference between the two arms based on the Kaplan-Meier curve, again, at five years. And the same trend is seen when we look at death alone. However, when we look at death or MI at five years of follow-up, Although it's not statistically significant in terms of the Kaplan-Meier curve, we do see that the difference does maintain. However, it does tighten up, meaning the difference is not as great at five years versus within the first two years. So something to keep in mind is that the durability may not be preserved, but the patterns are being seen. Let's move on now and evaluate the DEFER study. The reason to think about the DEFER study is that an obvious question comes up is how do patients do when we defer PCI based on the FFR value being greater than 0.8? Well, at the time of the DEFER study, which was published in 2007, we were actually using a cutoff of 0.75 for FFR. In fact, when you recall or look back at the table where I talked about the validation studies to which FFR was compared to, the best cutoff value was 0.75. However, in the FAME 1 trial, they really wanted to be sure not to miss potentially ischemic lesions, so they decided, excuse me, that the FFR value would be 0.8. And so from then on, the convention has been used being 0.8 as a cutoff. By the time of the DEFER study was done, 0.75 was a cutoff. So patients on this study were patients that had coronary stenosis of 50% or greater with a vessel diameter of at least two and a half millimeters, but who had oddly no documented ischemia. And these patients randomized either to deferral PCI or performance of PCI. By the way, these are 325 patients in the study. Again, patients that had coronary stenosis of 50% or greater. So in the deferral of PCI arm, if the FFR result was greater than 0.75, PCI was not performed, which you would expect. However, if the FFR value was less than 0.75, PCI was performed. Again, as you would ex expect. However, it may not be the right word there. And then if the patient was randomized to the performance of PCI arm, even if the FFR result was greater than 0.75, PCI was performed. This is referred to as the PERFORM group. And if the FFR value was less than 0.75, PCI was performed, and that became the referring group. And what we see here is that in the DEFER group, these patients did the best, that <clears throat> death or MI of five years was occurring in only 3.3% of patients. And then in terms of the referring group, not surprisingly, because these patients did have coronary artery disease, the event rate was high. It was 15.7%. And then the PERFORM group, it was higher than the DEFER group. These patients were getting inappropriate stents, and the event rate was about 7.9%. So actually, believe it or not, we have 15 years of follow-up data for the DEFER trial. And what we see here is when we pay attention primarily to MIs, what we find in the DEFER group compared to the PERFORM group and the reference group is that there are low, less MIs occurring in the DEFER group. So you know that these patients really at 15 years of follow-up have a low event rate and do quite well. There's no doubt about it. 
I want you to recall that in the MI trial, in fact, in the Kurz trial, at five years, it was 11.2%, and 4.5 years after seven years in the Rita 2 study. So this is pretty good results here using FFR, excuse me, FFR in the deferred trial to make that determination in clinical care. Now let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. Let's think about PCI strategies. So one strategy could be to stent everything, and another strategy could be to just stent functionally significant lesions. This strategy has really been advocated, as you can tell, in this talk. So if we think about the deferred trial, and we think about the FAME trial, and we think of the type of lesions, we know for a functionally significant lesion, the annual intrinsic risk of death or MI is about 5%. When we think of non-ischemic lesions, we think about the annual intrinsic risk of death or MI being 1% or less. And then we think about stented lesions, we think about that risk being about 3%. So if we have this hypothetic example where we have four lesions, two of which are physio physiologically or functionally significant, and two of which are non-ischemic, and we pick that strategy of stenting everything, what we find is that the intrinsic risk of stent everything is 12%. However, if we stent only these functionally significant lesions, the intrinsic risk of that strategy is only 8%, so a difference of 4%. So it's really important, I would say, based on just thinking about these concepts and using the data that's available to us from the deferred trial and the FAME trials, to really think about stenting only lesions that are truly producing myocardial ischemia. But an obvious question that comes up now is how does FFR-guided PCI really stand up compared to medical therapy? So this is something addressed in the FAME2 study. The FAME2 study basically is a redo of the CURS trial. So I want you to think about the CURS trial and realize that it was published in the late 2000s, and it being published in the late 2000s, many of those patients, actually none of those patients, underwent FFR. And those patients were primarily undergoing PCI with bare metal stents. So why is that important? Well, many of those patients may have undergone a PCI when actually they didn't have myocardial ischemia. And in addition to that, we're talking about older generation stents that don't have the same outcomes in terms of paraprocedural MI and other outcomes as our latest and greatest stents. So clear limitations. So I think it's really important to think about, uh, well, how does medical therapy compare to FFR-guided PCI? Again, this was a question addressed in the FAME2 study, a redo of the CURSE trial, in my opinion. So the inclusion criteria were patients with one, two, or three vessel coronary artery disease referred for PCI because they had CC as class one to three an angina. However, they initially had class four angina, but they were stabilized with medical therapy. And if they had atypical or no chest pain, they actually had to have documented ischemia. The exclusion criteria, the same as a FAME one trial for the most part. Left main disease, patients that had severe heart failure with an ejection fraction of 30% or less, and patients that had prior coronary artery bypass graft surgery. So as mentioned, patients involved in the study were those with stable ischemic heart disease that are scheduled for one, two, or three vessel PCI with drug eluding stents. The population study was relatively large, 1,220 patients, and FFR was performed in all target lesions. And so in patients that had one or more stenoses with FFR that was significant, positive with an FFR value of 0 0.8 or less, it was these 888 patients that underwent randomization. They went, underwent randomization to either PCI plus medical therapy or medical therapy alone. So again, this composed a randomized trial component of the study. Now, if patients had FFR results of greater than 0.8 in all lesions, in other words, they didn't have myocardial ischemia, this composed about 332 patients, those patients underwent medical therapy alone and they compose the registry. So in total, this represents about 27% of the 1,220 patients, and the 888 patients represent 73% of the 1,220 patients. I should also mention that 50% uh, of the patients in the registry group were randomly selected for follow-up, so not all the patients, just a, a random 50% of them.
and the follow-up was at one in six months, as well as <coughs> one, two, three, four, and five years. Moving on now, the primary endpoint for the FAME2 study was a composite of death from any cause, non-fatal MI, or unplanned hospitalization leading to urgent revascularization. So this graph shows that kaplan meier curves for the PCI plus medical therapy, medical therapy alone, and registry arms in terms of the primary endpoint and a mean follow-up of seven months. So at 12 months, 4.3% in the PCI plus medical therapy arm, that's shown here in orange, achieved this endpoint as compared to 12.7% in the medical therapy alone arm represented in red. And then in green is again the registry. These are patients that did not have myocardial ischemia. At two years, we see the same trend with a hazard ratio of 0.39. Now let's take a look at the individual components of the primary endpoint and see what they show. When we do that and we focus on all-cause mortality, what we find between the three arms, but really two arms of the study, is that there's no statistically significant difference between the three arms of the study in terms of all-cause mortality. The same thing is shown at two years. Now, in terms of myocardial infarction, the same trend. There's no significant differences between the three arms of the study at 12 or 24 months. The rate of MI in the PC arm, by the, by the way, arm, by the way, was 5.8% versus 6.8% in the medical therapy alone arm at two years. And then urgent revascularization. So clearly, the primary endpoint was driven by urgent revascularization, which many consider a soft outcome. On the other hand, urgent revascularization is a common endpoint in many clinical trials, and personally, I think it's important. I think about this, obviously, in my patients, and I'm sure you do as well. And as we pointed out, you'll see in the medical therapy arm that more patients are achieving this endpoint compared to the PCI plus medical therapy arm. And the same thing is being shown at 24 months or two years. This remains statistically significant. So again, this is a major driving force for the primary endpoint. So when we look at urgent revascularizations, we can break it down. This represents about 51.8% of patients with unstable angina. 21.4% of patients were having myocardial infarction. And about 26.8% of patients were having unstable angina with ECG changes. I think this is important to think about because the study wasn't randomized. So that raises a lot of concern that if a physician knew the patient was randomized to a particular arm, particularly the medical therapy arm, for example, they might be more inclined to really think about sending that patient to the cath lab. So it is an important criticism and a reasonable criticism. However, a post hoc analysis was done to combat that criticism. So when we look at the primary endpoint, excluding urgent revascularizations to unstable angina without ECG changes, so MI and then unstable angina plus ECG changes, this is what we find. We find actually that a similar pattern is found, that more patients in the medical therapy arm versus a PCI plus medical therapy arm are achieving this endpoint. But before I move on, I think it's really important to point out that this trial was stopped early by the Data and Safety Monitoring Board. Why was the data stopped? Why did the Data and Safety Monitoring Board stop the study early? Well, the results were very profound. The disadvantage of stopping this study early was that then we don't now have, or at the time we at least didn't have, long-term outcome data comparing PCI plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. However, that's different now because we have the ischemia trial. Now the ischemia trial suggests or indicates that there's no difference between medical therapy versus PCI plus medical therapy, though there are criticisms of that trial as well in the idea that FFR, or IFR, or non hyperbaric pressure ratios were not assessed routinely. So definitely a, a limitation. 
but, but something to think about. We want to think about the whole body of evidence when we're considering this very important question. Now let's think about the landmark analysis in terms of death or MI. So concerning this trial was that there was crossover between the two arms and looking at death or MI within the first seven days. And this was really driven by periprocedural MI. The patients undergoing PCI were having more periprocedural MI, and so they were achieving more of this endpoint within the first seven days. But after the first seven days, hence the term landmark analysis, ignoring the first seven days, what we find, in fact, actually more patients in the medical therapy arm are achieving this endpoint compared to the PCI plus medical therapy arm, and this interaction is statistically significant. So something to think about, that yes, there's more procedural MI with PCI within the first seven days, but when we look over a longer period of time, PCI plus medical therapy wins out versus medical therapy alone. And the same pattern is seen actually also at two years, with a p-value for the interaction being markedly below 0.05. Let's move on now and finally get into IFR. Let's talk about non hyperbaric pressure ratios as well in this discussion. So let's talk about the instantaneous wave-free ratio, the idea behind it. So a lot of bright individuals start thinking about in terms of FFR, well, is there a part in the cardiac cycle where naturally resistance could be low and constant? Do we have to give adenosine, especially because adenosine is costly, there's adverse effects related to it, and there are situations where patients can have coronary microvascular disease. And these situations where patients have coronary microvascular disease, when you give adenosine, their microvascular sure is not going to vasodilate. And because it's not vasodilating, your FFR result is going to be falsely higher than what it should be. So a lot of the thought process involved the concept of wave intensity analysis. Wave intensity analysis is derived from combined coronary pressure and flow data. And this can help us better understand the physiologic basis of IFR. So here in this first part of the figure, we have velocity. So we have flow velocity through the coronary vessel during the cardiac cycle. And what we're seeing, obviously, is that that flow velocity, coronary flow in the coronary vessel, is going to increase in diastole, and that's why you see that peak here. But you'll see that this decays over time during diastole. And this is just illustrated again in terms of looking at the coronary pressure, or aortic pressure tracing, and seeing that this is the upstroke, systole, and this represents diastole. Then when we look at coronary resistance, what we're finding is that there's a sharp upstroke in systole, but then when we get into diastole, there's a period that we'll talk about, the wave-free period in particular, where the resistance is low and constant. So if we ignore the rest of the cardiac cycle and just focus in on this area where coronary resistance is low and constant and focus on the pressures, maybe that ratio can be very helpful for us and we don't need to then give hyperemia and look at PDEPA under hyperemia because of the fact that we're essentially having resistance being constant here and canceling. So this introduced the idea of IFR, the instantaneous wave-free ratio and this very useful modality. So the instantaneous wave-free ratio or the instantaneous pressure ratio across the stenosis during the wave-free period when resistance is naturally constant and minimized in the cardiac cycle is what IFR is measuring. To be a little bit more specific, when we're looking at diastole and we're looking at the wave-free period, the wave-free period starts at 25% of diastole after the dichrotic notch. So after the dichrotic notch, 25% of diastole elapses and that commences the wave-free period. The wave-free period then ends five milliseconds before that upstroke in aortic pressure. I think it's also important to point out that the measurement is stable with IFR during this wave-free period at any instantaneous point. 
during this period. So when IFR was starting to be clinically introduced, there was a lot of issues related to it. This had to do with the fact that the scale is different, the cutoff is different. So FFR and IFR do indeed have different scales. In the same way that we measure temperature, we have different scales for temperature. Celsius and Fahrenheit, they both measure temperature, but have different scales. The, the freezing point is at a different point, whether we're talking about Celsius or Fahrenheit. In the same way, the IFR cutoff between ischemia and between having ischemia and not having ischemia is different. It's 0.89, and that matches a cutoff of 0 0.8 with FFR. I'd also have to say that the, the range, if you will, of values that you get with IFR are a little bit more tighter, if you will, where the ranges with FFR are spread out a little bit more. But when IFR was being studied in the advice to study, a pattern was being noticed. When in the advice to study, IFR was being compared to FFR and there's a valuation by discrepancies. And what was noticed when IFR values were between 0.86 to 0.93, that that's where we saw a lot of discrepancy between IFR and FFR, where, for example, an IFR result may be in the range of 0.87, where we would think that the lesion is producing myocardial ischemia. But then when we did FFR, we found out that actually it wasn't producing myocardial ischemia. So with the advice to study, what was devised was this hybrid algorithm where between 0.86 to 0.93, adenosine or whatever hyperemic was the choice of the operator would be administered and we would actually do FFR. So this would be the FFR zone. And we use FFR to make the decision when the IFR value is between 0.86 to 0.93. However, that changed with the defined flare in the IFR sweetheart trials as we'll discuss shortly. In fact, we'll do that now. We're now going to review the evidence for IFR. So we're about an hour and seven minutes into the lecture. Now would be a good time to take a little bit of a mental break, if you like, and pause the video. And then we'll go on and talk about IFR, the evidence for it, and also talk about non-hyperemic non pressure ratios, particularly when we speak of future directions. So let's specifically talk about the IFR Sweetheart trial. This is a trial based out of Sweden, which is designed as a non-inferior analysis. So basically the idea was to compare IFR to FFR using a non-inferior design. In this study, IFR was thought to be non-inferior to FFR at one year for the composite endpoint of all-cause death, so this is the primary endpoint of the study, non-fatal myocardial infarction, and unplanned revascularization. So the study, or the inclusion criteria, I should say, were very broad. So any patient with a clinical indication for a physiology-guided lesion assessment were included and randomized in one-to-one -one fashion to IFR-guided PCI versus FFR-guided PCI. Here in this trial, they do not use the hybrid algorithm. A cutoff of 0.89 was used. So if the IFR result was greater than 0.89, PCI was not performed. However, if the IFR value was 0 0.89 or less, IFR, excuse me, PCI was performed. In the FFR guided PCI arm, it was FFR as usual. We used a cutoff of 0 0.8. If the value was greater than 0 0.8, PCI was not performed. If the value was 0.8 or less, PCI was performed and patients were follow up at one year. In terms of procedural characteristics, no major differences. But I would like to point out, particularly being an operator here at UC Davis Medical Center, the large proportion of patients that did undergo radial artery approach. The study was done out of Sweden primarily, a European trial, so that's not surprising. But for the most part, Everything was uh, pretty similar among these uh, baseline uh, characteristics. The areas, though, that we were seeing a difference uh, was, importantly, in the number of lesions evaluated. Um, we were seeing, on average, a few more lesions being evaluated in the IFR arm compared to the FFR arm. 
But I think what's more interesting is the number, a percentage of functionally significant lesions, that we are finding more functionally significant lesions in the FFR arm compared to the IFR arm. And we'll talk about that shortly. In terms of procedural characteristics, uh, pretty similar. Uh, what I would point out, though, is a mean number of cents per patient undergoing PCI was, not surprisingly, less in the IFR arm compared to the FFR arm. So let's get into this in a little bit more detail. So what's important to understand when we look at that previous table as well as this table is that there were more deferrals of PCI in the IFR arm compared to the FFR arm. So that's an important teaching point of the Sweetheart IFR study as well as a defined flare trial. We saw that same pattern in both trials, and we'll talk about the defined flare trial in a second. That we're seeing more deferrals of PCI in the IFR, meaning when we do IFR, we're finding that lesions are ending up being greater than 0.89. They're being above that cutoff as compared to FFR. So we end up doing more PCI if we use that FFR modality if you take this information from the Sweetheart and Defined Flare Trials. Now let's look at the primary endpoint in one year. So the, com the primary endpoint or composite endpoint of death, MI, or unplanned revascularization is represented here on the y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we have months since randomization. And what we're fi finding among the 2019 patients, again, among the 2019 patients that we have an event rate of 6.7% in the IFR arm versus 6.1% in the FFR arm, but this meets the non-inferiority margin. So essentially, there's no difference between these two modalities. IFR is not unacceptably worse as compared to FFR with the advantage that we're not administering adenosine. So there's less harm to the patient and less cost as a whole to the healthcare system in assessing coronary physiology. Additionally, we have multiple subgroups being examined here. We have patients being examined, whether they're young or elderly, based on gender, based on whether they have hypertension, diabetes, smoking status, angina status, whether they're having an acute coronary syndrome. And for the most part, we're seeing very similar trends among all these subgroups with all p-values are not statistically significant. Now, here is a defined flare trial. So it had the same trial design. So patients undergoing functional assessment of an indeterminate coronary lesion were randomized to either IFR versus FFR. So roughly in this trial, there were 2,500 patients, to be specific, 2,492. But the point is the defined flare and IFR sweetheart trials are much larger trials then the FAME-2 as well as the FAME-1 studies. The FAME-1 study was about 1,200. And then in the FAME-2 study, if you really think about it, uh, and you think about the randomized trial component, it was only 888 patients. So with the defined flare in the ifr CDR trials, we're talking about a much larger population. And again, the results are similar, if not exactly the same, as compared to the ifr sweetheart trial. Here, though, it's a little different that actually FFR patients were achieving more than 0.7% versus 6.8%, but this reached the non-inferiority margin. And so IFR, again, is not unacceptably worse as compared to FFR. So to be specific, all-cause death, MI, or unplanned revascularization at 12 months was 6.8% in the IFR group arm versus 7% in the FFR group arm with a p-value well below 0 0.05, 0 0.001 for non-inferiority. We see the death rate is 1.9 versus 1.1% when it comes to FFR. And then in terms of MI, it's 2.7% versus 2.4%. And then when you think about unplanned revascularization, it's 4% versus 5.3%. So nothing that's really driving the endpoints. It's pretty similar among death, MI, or unplanned revascularization. And so clearly the adverse cardiac event rates were similar between the two study groups. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine at the same time the, the ifr heart trial was published as well. But an important criticism becomes, again, is that high rate of deferrals with 
IFR as compared to FFR. So what does that mean if we're deferring doing PCI in a patient that has an LED lesion? So that's an important question, an important criticism, and something to wonder about with IFR. So in the defined flare trial, they did a, a, a post hoc analysis looking at the outcomes after deferral of LED rasterization following FFR. So this is among 882 patients, again, um, looking at major adverse cardiac events, which was all-cause death, NMI, and unplanned revascularization. And what we're finding actually is that more patients on the FFR arm compared to the IFR arm are achieving this endpoint, actually 5.46% versus 2.44%. This is almost certainly driven by the fact that patients are having a lot of MIs and other complications because they're undergoing unnecessary PCI. So this is very reassuring that deferrals, particularly in the LED distribution, do not result in an increase in major adverse cardiovascular events when you're performing IFR. So let's move on now and talk about future directions. But now we have really made a compelling argument with randomized control trials, though using non-inferiority trial design, that IFR results in improved outcomes that is not unacceptably worse as compared to FFR. It establishes a precedence that IFR can be used using a simple cutoff of 0.89. We also do not need to use the hybrid algorithm that was discussed previously. But one issue with IFR is it's is proprietary. Phillips Volcano and Justin Davies, who was a creator of it, they have a patent on this. And so other companies are not able to use IFR. So you need to think about that. So future directions are really aimed at other non hyperbaric pressure ratios in diastole. But gosh, has there been quite a bit of evolution in terms of coronary physiology? It was first in 1989 that we first thought about the concept of PDPA. Then we had the DEFER trial being done. It was finally published in Jack in 2007. Then we had the FAME-1 trial looking at FFR versus angiography being published in 2009. And then we had the FAME-2 trial being published in 2012. We're having a lot of that data in 2012. We have the advice studies, the verified trials, the advice registry studies, all starting to look at IFR. It's not until 2014 that IFR is commercially available. And then recently, we have the defined flare and sweetheart IFR trials. And then we have cost analyses that I have not discussed here in this presentation, showing that it is very cost effective at one year. And then in terms of IFR sweetheart at two years of using IFR as compared to FFR. And this is all in the context of appropriate use guidelines being really spread, if you will. And then also thinking about the Syntax 2 trial, demonstrating when we use IFR and FFR that we can get really good outcomes similar to cabbage surgery. Also considering the fact that we are using a radial approach, intercoronary imaging, putting that all together, we can get an excellent result in our patients. Now let's talk about new hyperemia free indices or hyperemia or non hyperemic pressure ratio ratios. So many of them. So the first one I'll talk about is called DFR, diastolic hyperemia free ratio. This is commercially available through Boston Scientific using the comet wire. So we'll talk about this in more detail in a second, but DFR averages all PDPA values during diastole for which PA is less than the mean PA and there's a negative downslope of PD over time. So the advantage of using this approach is that, well, first is using diastole like IFR. So that's obviously really important because we know that there's a wave-free period and in the wave-free period of diastole, the resistance are, are constant and low. But the specific advantage of DFR is that you don't need to worry about the dichrotic notch. You don't need an EKG because you're looking at a part of diastole where you're well beyond it, where the PA value is well below the PA mean. And so we'll see that in the subsequent figures. Then we also have what's called a diastolic pressure ratio, DPR. 
So the diastolic PDPA, so in diastole measuring PDPA, so there's several variations. So DPR refers to the variations where maybe we're measuring diastolic PDPA during all of diastole, during mid-diastole, or at a minimum of minimum value in diastole. And what we find is from this study by Van Veer, the comparison of different diastolic resting indices to IFR, that using all these different types of DPR as well as DFR as well as RFR, that are all roughly analogous to IFR. Now, specifically in terms of RFR available commercially through Abbott using their pressure wire X, RFR refers to resting full cycle ratio. What that does is it takes the lowest PD, PDA at any point during the cardiac cycle. So now we're also including systole, and that's representing about only 11 to 12 percent of the values that we're, that we're using, but it is being included in terms of resting full cycle ratio. And so that's a deviation, if you will, as compared to IFR. And then we have resting distal aortic pressure, whole cycle PDPA. So just taking the whole cycle and looking at that ratio. So we have these four options now available. Again, DFR is available through Boston Scientific. DPR is available through Opsons, but also available with uh, the uh, Boston Scientific system. We have RFR available through the Abbott system, and all companies are able to do whole cycle PDPA. So now let's explore this in a little bit more detail. So figure A is something that you've seen already. So on the y-axis, we have pressure. On the x-axis, we have time, if you will, the, the cardiac cycle. And we have the wave-free period. We talked again how the wave-free period commences 25% of diastole after the dichrotic notch, and it's missing the last five milliseconds of diastole. And the reason we choose this is because resistances are constant and low during the wave-free period. Then we have DPR. So DPR is at any point during diastole, and we talked about all the various variations. Then we have DFR. So what DFR is measuring is that PA value when it's less than mean PA, so this is the mean PA, so it's going to start to measure here when there's a down sloping. So DFR is going to start to happen in this period, and so it's going to measure that. And that's what DFR represents. And then you have RFR. And RFR is then again taking the filtered mean PDPA throughout the whole cycle, but it's taking the lowest. And that's what it's using to, to make that measurement. And again, 11 to 12% of measurements will be occurring during systole. So how do these compare? So I talk about one study. There's another study called the IRIS FFR registry. So these are patients that did undergo FFR. And so to be more specific, there was 1,833 lesions among 15,000, excuse me, 1,500 patients with valid resting and hyperbaric raw pressure tracings where there was data for five or more beats. And it's just interesting to point out, 731 lesions were stented. So among those patients that were deferred, so again, among those patients that were deferred, what happened was that there was analysis in the Corla. So there was analysis through the IRS FFR register just looking at FFR. Then there was just looking at resting PDPA. Then with Niels Johnson, there was work using the volcano system just looking at the IFR. And then there were two individuals involved in looking at DPR, Ziad Ali out of CRF was looking at RFR, and then Niels Johnson was looking at DFR. And they just looked at the distribution among patients that had deferred FFR measurements, meaning that FFR values were not significant, and this is what they found. When you look at this, IRS FFR registry, what we find is that we have frequency, we have FFR, resting PDPA, IFR, DPR, RFR, DFR, and we're seeing that distribution. And then when we look at this distribution, what we find is that the IFR, DPR, RFR, and DFR, they're all roughly equivalent when we look at this distribution of values. And we're showing the median and the interquartile range, and they're all, again, roughly equivalent. So this is really compelling evidence that DPR, RFR, and DFR, 
as long as we're measuring in diastole, or at least primarily in diastole, that's with the caveat of RFR, then they're producing the same data that you would get with IFR. So very, very helpful information. And so this begs the question, do we need a randomized control trial for all these nine hyperemic pressure ratios? It's a tough question to answer. I think that this data, this registry data, although very helpful, it does really suggest that maybe we don't need to do a randomized control trial. I say although very helpful because of the fact that there is so much data looking at IFR. We have now used IFR to look at non-culprit lesions in STEMI in a lot of other scenarios. And then we understand the physiology of IFR as compared to FFR, but do we truly understand the physiology of DPR, RFR, and DFR? I think to some degree we understand the physiology of DFR, but not quite the same way we understand IFR. So definitely limitations in using these other modalities. I think unfortunately we're forced to use some of these other modalities because IFR is proprietary, and for a lot of hospitals, they're unable to actually contract with Phillips Volcano that produces IFR. And so these are good alternatives, but do have some limitations. Now, I want to take the last few minutes of this talk to discuss IFR co-registration. And so one great thing about the Phillips Volcano system and IFR is that when you perform IFR, if you perform a coronary angiogram afterwards, and of course, if you have the software, the Sync Vision software that allows you to do this, and you've done your pullback, what will happen is that you do your angiogram and values will be recorded on the vessel. And so there'll be angiographic co-registration where you can actually see dots representing where the pressure drop is occurring. Now, you certainly can do this without co-registration. We talked about how a coronary angiogram has very excellent spatial and temporal resolution. And so under fluoroscopy, if you're pulling a wire back slowly and carefully, you can look and see the pattern or pressure drop across the whole vessel, whether it's focal or diffuse, and then you can actually see the values. But I4 co-registration makes it a lot easier. In addition to that, you can do measurements of length along the vessel too, which can really help you in terms of deciding the length of a stent. So again, I4 co-registration takes advantage of the unrivaled spatial and temporal resolution of the angiogram and identifies the exact location of each pressure drop and assesses the most significant lesion. So it, it's very, very helpful. In this talk, we can't talk too much about the issue of tandem lesions, serial lesions, and the limitations of FFR in that assessment as compared to IFR. Suffice it to say that when we're looking at rusting gradients, it's more easy to predict what the effect of serial lesions would be if you fix one lesion as compared to doing FFR and you fix one lesion. Sometimes they're very surprised by the hyperemic response to, or flow response to the lesion that wasn't treated. And so IFR can have a lot of advantages when we're dealing with serial lesions and the co-registration makes that a lot easier. And so this is just a schematic just showing uh, what's taking place here and showing the pressure drops and showing how you get this tracing that you can look at and analyze. And then you can determine whether there's focal disease where you see a whole bunch of represented dots showing focal disease or there's diffuse disease where there's dots throughout the entire vessel. So very helpful to do this co-registration, but again, can be figured out even without co-registration. This is not an absolute must. And this is actually what it looks like on our console here at UC Davis when we do co-registration. So before I end this talk, I'd like to just talk about the universe of coronary physiology. So this is a really great figure, I believe, uh, produced by Morton Kern and Arnold Cito out of UC Irvine uh, in form of an editorial published in 2017. And what is shown here is FFR. And so you have the planet of FFR, and then you have these satellites of IFR, PDPA, various ratios related to it, and then with FFR, you have contrast FFR, things that we didn't talk about that will be discussed in the future grand rounds by me 
is coronary flow reserve. And then when we're thinking about the cath lab, we can get out of the cath lab and think about before a patient even arrives to the cath lab about FFRCT. We want to move away from anatomical assessment, but coronary CTA does allow us to get a percent diameter stenosis. We can get physiology by doing myocardial perfusion imaging. We can get some physiology as well from a terminal stress echocardiogram. Actually, that's shown here. And then we get very helpful information about exercise physiology in terms of treadmill stress test. But all of this is really together. And so we want to use all of this together so that we can make sure that in whatever treatment strategy that we use to help a patient, whether it's medical therapy because the lesions are not ischemic or whether it's PCI because the lesions aren't functionally ischemic, to ensure the patient gets the best outcome possible. That's the point of this talk. Although this talk is really focused on FFR and IFR, we had to digress and talk about stable ischemic heart disease, unstable angina, and the use of FFR and IFR in that scenario and the comparison to medical therapy. It's because a lot of that data was produced in that context, in that argument. So the take-home messages. FFR is a lesion-specific measure of the extent to which an epicardial stenosis limits maximal myocardial blood flow. I will say that IFR also is a lesion-specific measure. Certainly, FFR should be performed in any patient with a coronary stenosis by angiography in the range of 40 to 90 percent and equivalent or absent stress imaging findings. So if you don't have stress imaging findings, you have this intermediate stenosis, we really do need to think about using coronary physiology. Other things that I didn't get into in this talk are that we find out that the physical significance of lesion is also related to the amount of myocardium subtended by that lesion. So if, for example, we have an LED lesion that's only 30%, but it's a proximal LED, it might be able to produce myocardiocemia that's functionally significant, particularly if it's collateralizing the right coronary artery, where then now it's supplying not only the LED coronary bed, but also the RCA coronary bed. So that stenosis becomes even more important. I'll also say that FFR rightfully challenges current paradigms in multivessel coronary artery disease and functionally complete revascularization. It's really important to remember that FFR was studied primarily in the context of multivessel coronary artery disease. FFR guided PCI is certainly superior to angiography guided PCI, but long term results in comparison to medical therapy are not yet known. That's controversial. We do have the ischemia trial, um, but I will mention in the ischemia trial that there wasn't as much FFR or other forms of coronary physiology done as we would hope or want. I would also say that IFR-guided PCI is not inferior to FFR-guided PCI. In addition, IFR is associated with a reduction in cost, actually specifically $896 at one year when using IFR compared to FFR. And FFR and IFR, as well as other non hyperbaric pressure ratios, both have a routine role, or all have a routine role in the cath lab, but limited data is currently available regarding trends in use. We really need to better understand, are we using FFR, IFR, and non-hyperbaric pressure ratios enough? That's a real concern. In fact, many cardiology fellows, interventional cardiology fellows, I should say, do not feel comfortable using coronary physiology I feel like that's not the case for our interventional cardiology fellows, but in a recent survey, a great majority of fellows, interventional fellows, really express that concern. Similarly, they express that concern with intercoronary imaging. So with that, this is now complete. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this two-hour presentation on coronary physiology, which I hope you find very comprehensive, and I hope we'll get you excited about this space of interventional cardiology. This is an important area that results in improved patient outcomes, and we need to do more of this. I'm really excited about the growth in this area, and I think it's wonderful to see that we may be able to assess coronary physiology with a heart flow system and other systems using coronary CTA even before a patient gets in the cath lab. And then once in their cath lab, we might be able to do this very quickly using a coronary angiogram with a cathode system and other systems. So 
it's a really wonderful area of coronary physiology that I'm glad to be a small part of. I also wanted to mention that this lecture is has been recorded and is uploaded to my website, tinyurl.com slash ucdcards. There are other lectures there as available, as well as a lot of helpful resources for our medical students here at UC Davis, as well as our residents, and of course, our general cardiology fellows and our interventional cardiology fellows. So again, thank you so much for listening to this lecture. It's very, my, it's very much my pleasure to speak on this topic. Good luck.